the final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 11495 in the name of Malcolm Chisholm on nursing against health inequalities. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I'd invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. Mr Chisholm, if you are ready. The uh, Royal College of Nursing's uh, Nursing at the Edge initiative, firstly because I've always uh, had the highest regard and paid close attention to the RC, and secondly because uh, I regard nurses as absolutely crucial in terms of their leadership uh, and in terms of their innovation skills, and thirdly because there is no more important subject for us to consider in this Parliament than Scotland's unacceptable health inequalities. It's also good timing the debate today because of the, the Health Committee brought out its uh, report on health inequalities this week, and we had a debate on mental health yesterday which also uh, flagged up uh, health inequalities. Now, the Health Committee rightly point out that health inequalities reflect wider inequalities in society, and there is no doubt that preventing health inequalities at a population level does require radical action to combat wider societal inequalities. But at the same time, we simply have to respond and respond more effectively to the health inequalities that currently exist. And the Health Committee was therefore also right to highlight the role of the health service. It seems to me that Nursing at the Edge is an outstanding example of the health service working collaboratively to reduce health inequalities. And the six case studies in the uh, Nursing at the Edge uh, document are truly inspiring demonstrations of what can be achieved through compassionate care of some of the most vulnerable individuals and communities in Scotland. It was a great pleasure for me to host a reception for Nursing at the Edge in December and to meet and hear from the nurses uh, involved and the people who had been helped. I also met a student nurse called uh, Louisa who writes a brilliant blogs uh, on nursing and other matters under rararouge.com and it is worth reading the whole of her blog on nursing uh, at the edge and I just want to quote uh, one little bit of it. Nursing at the edge, she wrote, promotes a culture of change, highlights the unique contribution nurses make to our current healthcare context and portrays the benefits of nurse-led initiatives. Our former CNO, Ross Moore, recently stated that the way forward is by building on our traditions, not relying on them. And I think Nursing at the Edge embodies that perfectly. We certainly see a powerful culture of innovation in the work of these nurses, moving from traditional settings to the places where vulnerable individuals are to be found. As Hilda Campbell of Cope put it, too many people think nurses only work in wards, but I believe that to make a real difference, the streets have to be our words, words. So if I can just briefly uh, describe uh, the six projects that are highlighted. Clearly they are demonstration projects in a way. We want these uh, initiatives to continue, but we want similar uh, initiatives to be promoted, particularly by the new health and social care partnerships, because this is uh, a very good time to be debating this as those uh, new bodies are about to start. They are charged with combating health inequalities, and I think some of the projects and initiatives we are considering today they are exactly the kind of work that is required by those health and social care uh, partnerships. So COPE, I've already mentioned, in Drumchapel, caring over people's emotions, it stands for. It focuses on mental health, health improvement and well-being, and is often helping people who are at the end of their tether. And I was struck by one of the women who was helped who said, it's great to be somewhere you're not judged. If it wasn't here, I wouldn't be here. And there are many, many individuals who have accessed that service who would not access mainstream health services. Secondly, Fife's alcohol-related brain damage service, caring for people who don't expect to be cared for. And it's worth noting here that it's not only turned around the lives of many individuals, but also reduced a and &E attendances and hospital admissions, which is always a matter of great importance for us as well in terms of changing the balance of care. Martin Murray and Inverclyde, I myself uh, met and spoke to at the reception. He works at the Inverclyde, Inverclyde Homelessness Centre and he points out that many are distrustful of health workers and disengaged from the services, but he is able to refer people to services, build their well-being and their sense of self-worth. Uh, I'm glad that Jess Davidson is in the gallery. She works uh, uh, to support uh, uh, and care those who are in custody and is based uh, in various uh, police stations in the Lothians uh, and the Borders with a team, obviously, to support her. She has a passion for delivering care that meets the needs 
and situations of those people who are uh, in custody. And uh, she believes, and I, I totally accept what she's saying, that without her service there, these individuals would not be uh, cared for appropriately at all. And she and her colleagues have treated around 8,000 people in the last uh, year, demonstrating, I think, the compassionate care that I referred to earlier on. One Stop Women's Learning Centre is an award-winning Perth-based project for women offenders. Uh, Karen Duncan there offers health checks uh, and as a trusted source of help and advice, but also refers on to other agencies. And the sixth project that's highlighted in the document uh, is a, a bloodborne virus clinic in Dumfries Prison. And Elaine Murray, my colleague beside me, I'm sure, will be speaking more uh, uh, about that service. But again, uh, far more people use that service than would use an equivalent service in a hospital. So as I said before, I think these are exemplars. We need to support these projects, but we need to learn from them and try and develop other similar initiatives to combat the unacceptable health uh, inequalities that we see in our communities. They are all examples of services that reach out to people who might otherwise not have a service or not use a service. They are also examples of the more intensive services that are required for those most uh, in need. Now is the time to develop such services, especially at the start of the new health and social care integration partnerships. They, as I've already said, will have a specific responsibility for reducing uh, inequalities, so the Scottish Government must provide them with resources to put these services on a sustainable long-term um, footing. And that's one of the main uh, objectives of the campaign, is to uh, highlight the inadequacies of short-term funding and the need for sustainable long-term funding for initiatives such as these to combat health inequalities, because we all know that uh, often in the past it has been on the basis of short-term project funding. And there's an RCN petition, uh, which you can uh, find uh, uh, and sign, hopefully, which is supporting uh, that uh, central objective of sustainable long-term uh, funding. Integration bodies also must ensure that services aimed at reducing health inequalities uh, employ enough nurses, including nurses with relevant uh, experience and expertise, to provide a stable, well staffed and empowered service for the people who use them. And empowering the frontline staff, I think, is absolutely crucial to this as well. Empowering them and trusting them to take the initiatives and make the decisions. Finally, there needs to be robust measurement and evaluation uh, of these projects to establish a strong body of evidence. But I am in no doubt that all the services highlighted in Nursing at the Edge would emerge as successful, invaluable and beacons of excellence. Many thanks. And I now call on Rhoda Grant to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Four minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, um, Presiding Officer. Um, can I start by congratulating Malcolm Chisholm on securing the debate? This is an issue he is passionate about and continues to champion. I also want to draw with him draw attention to the Health and Sport Committee report into health inequalities. And it's clear that health inequalities are a symptom um, of our unequal society rather than the cause. The cause is income inequality, housing inequality. It also leads to educational inequality. And these culminate in the lack of opportunity that it can also be perpetuated through generations. A parent's poverty means that a child is brought up in poverty. Therefore, we need to tackle the poverty of the parent, especially the mother, to break that cycle because the mother's income has the biggest influence on a child's potential future income. There's no easy fix. That's why it has to be cross-departmental, cross-committee, and indeed, if we're really committed, committed to this, would be an issue for every organisation, business and individual in this country. We all lose if someone doesn't reach their full potential and what they would have contributed to society is lost to all of us. That said, we do have inequalities in healthcare. People from poorer backgrounds do not access health services as quickly as their more affluent neighbours. And there's a variety of reasons for this. Uh, the distance from services, um, the cost of accessing services through the transport system. Daily pressures such as fighting for survival often leave little time to take care of yourself. And a lack of expectation of help or indeed an entitlement to services and indeed good health. 
On the other hand, services are demanded by the more affluent in our society who are used to accessing services and assistance and knows their rights and entitlement to treatment. And this means that they're more likely to access health service as well um, due to the lifestyle. They enjoy better health altogether. But I'm not advocating that we ration health care for the better off, only that we put in place strategies that ensure the less well off access the same level of care or more if their health dictates it. The RCN, as Malcolm Chisholm mentioned, are used to dealing with health inequalities. And to highlight that work, they've launched their initiative, eh, Nursing at the Edge. And it shows the wonderful work that nurses do combating health inequalities. Um, as was eh, pointed out, they recently held a reception in the Parliament where nurses and service users talked about the impact of some of those initiatives. And as Malcolm said, in the case of COPE, many were life-saving. And I think it was very hard not to be moved by listening to the experience of those who benefited from that nursing support. And I think that was an excellent reception, bringing home to all of us the very practical support that people were getting from nurses. I also agree with the motion in that it says that health and social care integrated boards must tackle health inequalities, ensuring resources go where they're most needed, both in health promotion and health care. They can't do it alone. We mu must all take on board uh, this issue and ensure that we tackle health inequalities. And it must become a focus for all government departments. And only then will we see a difference. I'm grateful that along with the RCM, there are many, many voluntary organisations and others who recognise the scale of the problem. They're not put off by the large scale of the problem, but step by step, they're determined to deal with the deep, de deepening divide of health inequalities, making a real difference to people's lives. Presiding officer, we must all strive for the day that health inequalities, and indeed the cause of health inequalities, no longer exists. Many thanks. And I now call on Mark Macdonald to be followed by Patricia Ferguson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I congratulate Malcolm Chisholm on securing this debate and also commend the work that is being done by the RCN uh, and the Nursing on the Edge um, project, I suppose you could call it, or campaign. I think it's a very uh, worthy uh, cause that is being pursued and one which I'm sure finds common cause across the chamber in terms of the need to reduce uh, and indeed eradicate health inequalities. Um, Malcolm Chisholm made, uh, I think, a, a good point relating to the work that the Health Committee did, and I was involved early on in the Health Committee during the the work on the, the, the issues around health inequalities. And I think that often when the NHS is presented um, with an individual, it, it is often what you could say too late in the process. They are presenting at the point at which those inequalities have manifested themselves rather than the point at which those inequalities could be appropriately tackled. That's not to say that the health service and health workers don't have a, a key role to play. And I note in the, uh, in, on the RCN's uh, Nursing at the Edge website, um, it, it states um, that, for example, actions that, that are more likely to be effective in mitigating the effects of health inequalities at an individual level may require redesign of public services. They include targeting high-risk individuals, intensive tailored support for those with greatest need, and a focus on early child development. That's from the Health Inequalities Policy Review in 2014. I think, for example, family nurse partnerships are going to play a key role in terms of that early child development angle. But I also note that with uh, the, the coming of integration of health and social care, I note the, uh, the asks of the RCN on, on their website, in particular around authority, which says integration authorities should ensure that nurses and other professionals can make swift decisions to help people living in the most deprived circumstances to improve their health and well-being. This will mean frontline staff like nurses controlling appropriate resources and using efficient non-bureaucratic referral routes to a wide range of care and support needed by those using their services. And I think it's important when we, we take uh, part in debates in the chamber that where we know that there is good practice that exists, we should bring that forward. And I want to highlight good practice that exists within my own constituency and highlight the work of the Middlefield Healthy House, which is a nurse practitioner-led um, service which uh, will see people living in Middlefield or Cummings Park, which are regeneration communities in the city of Aberdeen. And I'm sure those who came up to campaign during the Dawnside by-election will be familiar 
with those communities. Uh, indeed, uh, I'm not sure if Mr Chisholm, during his time as Health Minister, uh, had the opportunity to visit the facility. I know that my predecessor, the late Brian Adam, was a keen advocate and champion of that facility, and Michael Matheson, in his role as uh, Minister for Public Health, visited uh, in 2013 during the course of the by-election. I say to the the, the new minister that uh, if he was uh, so minded to visit the facility at some stage he would find himself most welcome uh, in the city of Aberdeen to visit. But the nurse practitioners there are able to offer a range of services to individuals on a drop-in basis uh, and often it reduces um, the need for individuals to then go on to GP services. However, it also allows for direct referrals to be made by those nurses to the appropriate services and counselling services are also available as well. So it, it, I think it's a strong example of nurses working at the front line in some of our poorest communities in Aberdeen uh, and making a real and noticeable difference to the lives of the individuals there. There is, however, a sour note uh, to end on, or a potential sour note to end on, which obviously due to the um, Hadigan Improvement Project, which will uh, create a, a, a large amount of dislocation in the Middlefield community, the future of the Healthy Hoose remains at present uncertain. Um, NHS Grampian have not yet given a commitment to continuing the facility either in its existing location or in a new location if that is required as a result of uh, works that take place. The Middlefield Community Project has secured an opportunity for a new facility at the local community centre. I think there would be an opportunity for NHS Grampian to work in collaboration with the City Council to try and ensure that the healthy who could potentially be accommodated within that facility as well, which would be a benefit not just to the communities that are served, but also to those who are working in those communities and delivering such a good service. Many thanks. I now call on Patricia Ferguson to be followed by Dr Annette Milne. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And may I congratulate my colleague Malcolm Chisholm on securing this debate about an issue I know he cares deeply about and to which he brings considerable knowledge. I would also want to thank the RCN and its members for the sterling work they have done in highlighting a problem that we are all too familiar with and for doing so in a practical way, making suggestions about how real change could be achieved. And I would also like to agree with the motion where it recognises the diversity and depth of the roles that nurses play in reducing equalities. And I would also want to recognise the GP practices and health centres, often categorised as deep end practices. All of them deserve our recognition for the work they do on a day in and day out basis. But as I've said, presiding officer, that there are inequalities in health across this country is all too evident from the statistics with people in my own constituency of Maryhill and Springburn having a life expectancy of some eight to ten years less than that of people in communities a mere mile or two away. And people in the communities I serve are also more likely to be diagnosed later in the course of an illness or condition, making their prognosis worse and their treatment more difficult. And when they do ask for help, they will not always have the support to enable them to take full advantage of the services that might be on offer. Now, there are some wonderful projects and initiatives aimed at providing that support and aimed too at encouraging people to become involved in their community and to have more of a say in their own lives and to shape what happens in their areas. But of course we need to look at the statutory services too and that is where I think the RCN report comes in. The ideas that it puts forward seem in some ways quite obvious, but they do require change to processes, processes that in many cases are long established. And as we know, changing long established practice is never easy. So it's helpful at this stage in the development of uh, the shared practice to read about their ideas and to see the case studies they have identified. The six projects described in the report are all very interesting and extremely worthwhile. But I wanted to focus particularly on the Inverclyde Homelessness Centre. Now, not a project in my constituency, of course, but one that has relevance to us all. And it seemed to me that the nurse identified there, Martin Murray, has such a good understanding of the issues facing his homeless patients and understands on a very real level that the help they need from him is as much about encouragement and support through the process as it is about providing health care in its straightforward and purest form. 
And I know that my colleague uh, Duncan McNeill has um, met with Martin Mur Murray and has a great deal of respect for him and for the work that he does. And Martin Murray makes an important point in the interview he gave for the RCN uh, report when he said that homelessness is bad for your health. Of course he's right about that. And poverty, addiction and loneliness are all bad for your health too. And they all need the joined up approach that Martin Murray and his colleagues and other agencies he works with provide. Support that is intensive and dedicated and there when it's needed. But the services, of course, need to be long term if they are to be useful and to be worthwhile. And they must be supported by long term funding. That's what the RCN advocates and that's what we must support. We must support them in this vital work. And we must do it not just in debates like this evening's, important though that is, but we must also do it in the policies we advocate in our political parties and more crucially still in the budgets that we pass in this parliament. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Dr Nanette Milne to be followed by Neil Finlay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Like others, I want to congratulate Malcolm Chisholm <coughs> for securing time for this debate and for bringing such an important issue to the Chamber at a crucial time and coinciding with the publication of the Health and Sport Committee's report on health inequalities. A short debate like this can clearly just scratch the surface of such a complex problem, but it shines a light on the major role that the nursing profession can have in moving things forward. We'll soon have a health and sport committee debate on the subject of health inequalities, which will highlight the need as stressed in the RCN's initiative, Nursing at the Edge, to make significant efforts across several policy areas and to involve many different agencies in collaborating and working together if meaningful progress is to be made on improving the lives and life expectancy of people living in our most deprived communities and bringing their expectations of health and well-being more into line with those of, the, of people in more affluent parts of the country. Many attempts have been made by successive governments to tackle health inequalities, with public campaigns against issues like smoking, alcohol and drug misuse, poor diet and lack of exercise, which are all known to lead to health problems. But these campaigns have largely benefited people from more prosperous areas who have paid heed to them, and in fact have widened the health gap between, those, between them and those who live in areas of significant deprivation. The problem of health inequalities is extremely complex, as the Health and Sport Committee discovered when taking evidence in its inquiry, and extends far beyond health, with very clear linkages between socio-economic deprivation and poverty and poor health and well-being, raised morbidity levels and lower life expectancy. To reduce health inequalities, the primary social and economic causes will need to be addressed, but that in itself wouldn't be enough to make the required difference. It's clear there's a need for collaboration across many agencies and professions, and now is a good time to be moving forward with this as we progress with implementing the recently enacted health and social care integration legislation. The RCN's Nursing at the Edge initiative launched last November with its aim of combating health inequalities shows by the example of its six case studies just how much can be achieved at local community and personal level by health and social agency personnel coming together, forgetting their professional differences and focusing absolutely on the needs of the people seeking help with their multiple problems. The lives of a significant number of people have been transformed by this joint working initiative and there's a real opportunity to learn from these case studies and help many more individuals to achieve a better and healthier way of life. Presiding officer, I hope that the Shadow Health and Social Integration Boards will look at the RCN initiative and give consideration to supporting services such as those highlighted in the Nursing at the Edge case studies. And bear in mind the calls for investment in nursing roles which allow such services to succeed and the merits, and in fact the need, for long-term secure funding for those services designed to reduce health inequalities which are proven to be effective. This would require joint action by the Scottish Government, NHS boards, local authorities and the Shadow Integration Boards. But I'm certain that to achieve a meaningful reduction in health inequalities, such collaboration will be essential. Presiding Officer, I look forward to progress being made in the near future and I commend the RCN for so effectively demonstrating a way forward. And Malcolm Chisholm for bringing the Nursing at the Edge initiative to the attention of Parliament this evening. Thank you. Many thanks. <clears throat>
I now call on Neil Finlay to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you, thanks, President Officer, and congratulate Malcolm Chisholm on uh, bringing forward this debate. It is, of course, uh, right that we pay tribute to the work of our nursing staff and, and the work that they are doing on the very front line of health care, working in very difficult circumstances in our most disadvantaged communities and prisons, working with the homeless and with people with addictions. They truly are in the front line of the battle and debate about health inequalities. And, uh, this issue of health inequality should be an issue that gets us angry. It gets me very angry and very frustrated. Angry that there can be up to a 28-year difference in life expectancy between someone living in an affluent community in Scotland and those living in a community like the one I live in. Angry that despite all the reports, all the warm words, all the platitudes, there's little real commitment to taking the radical action required to close the health and wealth gap that is literally killing my constituents, members of my family, my neighbours and my friends and those of many people in this chamber. President officer, if someone dies in an accident, there is often an investigation and action by the authorities, yet day in and day out, people are dying of poverty and a result of inequality, yet little major change occurs. We know that in Scotland, the poorest people are most likely to be affected by poor mental and physical health, suffer from obesity, lower birth weight, poor educational performance, be a victim of violence, more likely to go to prison, have fewer life opportunities and more likely to be unemployed. And our nurses and community health staff are left to try and pick up the pieces, but they're working with two hands tied behind their backs because, as we read in the uh, book The Spirit Level, policymakers treat all of these things as though they are quite separate from one, other, one another, each needing separate services and remedies. So while police, social workers and nurses are, are expensive services that uh, help many people, our society simply recreates these problems over and over again. And all the time we fail and fail again to address the real issues of deprivation, poverty and inequality. And contrary to tabloid headlines, health inequality is not caused by the lifestyle choices of the feckless. As the Health Committee reported earlier this week, experts told them that the effect of lifestyle public health campaigns encouraging people to eat more healthily, give up smoking, exercise uh, more and drink less actually widens health inequalities rather than narrows them. The reality is that health inequality is caused by wealth inequality and it is only by seeking to tackle that inequality in a serious way that we will see an improvement to the shocking statistics that we know currently exist in Scotland. As Dr Jerry McCartney of the Scottish Public Health Observatory said in December, interventions that redistribute income, such as increasing tax or implementing the living wage, are amongst the most effective interventions in reducing inequalities and improving health. And of course, he is right. And let me say this in finishing, we will never address health inequality if we cut taxes for the wealthy and benefits for the poor. We will never address an almost 30-year life expectancy in some areas when we see local government services cut as people in the most expensive properties gain while the poorest lose their essential services. And we will never address poverty if your biggest fiscal pledge is to cut the taxes for corporations at the same time as 400,000 of our citizens earn less than the living wage. President officer, health inequalities are Scotland's real shame. I pay tribute to our nurses and community health staff and the work that they do day in, day out. But unless we see whole government action and a commitment to address such inequality, then our nursing staff will forever be treating the symptoms of our society. I pay tribute to them, uh, to the work that they do, and I wish them well for the future. Many thanks. I now call on Bob Doris to be followed by Dr Elaine Murray. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Can I start off by praising Malcolm Chisholm for bringing this debate uh, to the Chamber this afternoon and, of course, for the RCN for the Nursing at the Edge uh, uh, project, which I think has illustrated some of the huge problems uh, tackling health inequalities within a deprived environment in Scotland, but the huge opportunities and gains that are there if some of the inspirational work is, is rolled out further across our, our communities that are done by nurses and others. And of course, I should uh, praise nurses. I know every day the, 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 the difficult jobs they do. My wife has been a nurse uh, for, for many years and leaves me no doubt the challenges facing the NHS, but also the, the fine work that takes place on a daily 
basis also. I might address some of Mr Finlay's points in the last minute of his speech, if I have time, in my last minute of my speech, but the first three minutes I thought was absolutely spot on, I have to say that. Uh, 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 in the chamber this afternoon. I want to deal with some of the, 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 the issues raised uh, by the RCA. I think that's important within, with, with, within this debate this afternoon, and then I'll come back on to the more generals later. I, I'd maybe say about the, the idea about um, the integration bodies prioritising funding to address health inequalities. Absolutely. I think it's also fair to point out that Scottish Government budgets via their allocation to the NHS and via their allocation to local authorities and other bodies have a variety of indicators in it which recognises inequality and deprivation. And there may be, we can have a debate about whether those are sensitive enough or have to be tweaked or changed or altered, and that's an honest debate to have. But we can only have that debate if we're serious about it. We can't just say more money for this, more money for that. We have to look at the formulas across all of uh, local authorities and the health board and other voluntary organisations if we're going to be do that in a meaningful way. But absolutely, I would be up for that, that challenge. Also, I thought uh, something that resonated with myself was uh, the RCN being, being clear that um, you know, integration boards should be consulting with staff, nurses and other staff and professionals on the ground and service users, users of vital services, when they decide what their plans are to tackle health inequalities. That really chimed with me in terms of, a, of an organisation that I visited a number of times in Rutherglen called Healthy and Happy, who take a real community empowerment view to how they improve the, the health and well-being of a, of a community. And they don't tell a community how they should be happy or healthy. They work with them and they let them nurture what works for them. You know, it's important to say, people, to say to people you shouldn't smoke and you shouldn't drink. Those are important brief interventions that do have an effect. But the biggest effect you can have other than tackling income inequality in society to tackle health inequalities is actually to empower people. And I think it, linking into the Community Empowerment Bill is also vitally important. And that shows the possibility of tackling health inequalities in a cross-cutting way across society. It's only fair when we're talking about inequalities, and I'm sure Duncan McNeill, if he's speaking this to people, talk about the inverse care law, is when we roll out the Community Empowerment Bill and funds that will be leveraged in to allow communities to take more control and ownership over their, their everyday lives, that the middle class communities might rally to that cause quicker than the working class communities. Although it's important for all our communities, we have to make sure that inverse care law doesn't happen as an inverse community empowerment law also, and I think that's a reasonable thing to say. There's so much else in the, the RCN report. Apologies that I can't mention any more. But I should say about the Health Committee report, yes, universalism can increase health inequalities, but everyone's health improves. The Health Committee was clear. We are wedded to universalism. We don't question is it. We talked about you know, universalism max or universalism plus, about having the universal programmes, but also focused uptake for those programmes in our most deprived communities and doing both of those things. In the few seconds I have left, I have to return to income inequality and say, yes, let's have a decent living wage and minimum wage in this country. Yes, let's stop the scourge of welfare reform. Yes, let's not affect 100,000 100, disabled people in Scotland losing over £1,000 a year because of UK welfare reforms. The real levers of power to tackle health inequalities across society. We don't have those levers of power, but I'm committed across party that irrespective of the levers of power we have, we must do all we can in this place to tackle health inequalities. I thank Malcolm Chisholm again for bringing this to the floor of the Chamber this afternoon. Many, many thanks. I now call on Dr Lane Murray to be followed by Duncan McNeill. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I add my congratulations to Malcolm Chisholm for bringing this debate to the Chamber this evening and also for hosting the RCN uh, briefing and reception on the issue on the 3rd of December, which I attended. And at that reception, I was delighted to meet uh, one of the nurses highlighted in the RCN's Nursing at the Edge campaign as working to reduce health inequalities. Uh, Marie Murray, along with her colleagues, Dr Gwyneth Jones and Professor Hazel Borland, who is the Executive Nurse Director for NHS of Fries and Galloway. Marie is a, an infectious disease specialist nurse with the local NHS, who delivers a regular clinic at Her Majesty's Prison, Dumfries. Now, the public often has little sympathy for offenders, but it is undeniable that offenders and ex-offenders often suffer particularly poor health for many reasons, including multiple deprivation, literacy problems and exclusion. 
Drug and alcohol and substance abuse leads to crime, and as we all know, it also has important health uh, consequences. The use of intravenous drugs such as heroin and the sharing of needles lead to the development of blood-borne viruses such as HIV and Hep C. Originally, in offenders in Dumfries Prison who had been identified with blood-borne infectious diseases were taken from prison to Dumfries and Galloway Royal Infirmary for appointments. But Marie soon realised that treatment would be less stigmatising and more successful if it was her who travelled to the prison to see the uh, offenders uh, and, and take part in their treatment. There she works alongside colleagues such as addiction nurse Amanda Allen. And because offenders in prison are in prison for a period of time, the chances of completing a course of treatment for infection and addressing the underlying problems of addiction are greater and prison provides an opportunity to change their lives around. The, the team also recognised that support after release is important to maintain treatment and to prevent relapse into destructive life, lifestyles. Liaising with voluntary sector organisation, homelessness and benefit services, social work and criminal justice and drug and alcohol teams to ensure that support continues are coupled with an ongoing medical service at the Royal Infirmary and outreach cl clinics in Annan and Stranraer to support ex-offenders on release into the community. The team is also involved in the treatment of people with hepatitis B, which is not curable but can be monitored and managed. The virus is prevalent in Chinese and South Asian communities due to poor infection control in the countries of origin, and Marie's team now has a cohort of over 70 patients across Dumfries and Galloway, predominantly from the Chinese community, although her team are also working to improve communications with other ethnic minority communities in Dumfries and Galloway who may also be at risk from Hep B. It was clear when I met Marie and her colleagues last month that they are passionate and enthusiastic about their work and about supporting their patients. And I'm hoping to be able to meet with the team in Dumfries itself to learn more about their important work. Fortunately, treatment for blood-borne viruses such as Hep C and HIV are much improved, but we know that prison, the prison population is significantly at risk. Now, I'm aware that the government will be publishing the revised Sexual Health and Blood-Borne Viruses Framework this year, and I realise that the refreshed document is still in the early stages of development. However, I hope that the government will give careful consideration to the suggestion of opt-out testing and screening of prisoners for blood-borne infections such as Hep C or HIV at the time when prisoners start their custodial sentence, because it's at that time if these infections are detected that will enable the sorts of interventions that Marie and her colleagues uh, are able to put in place. We need these services in all our prisons. HMP Dumfries and NHS Dumfries and Galloway are trailblazing, but it must be replicated elsewhere across the Scottish prison estate. It isn't only a matter of addressing the offender's health issues. There are a range of other interventions and support mechanisms which can accompany medical treatment, which can also reduce the risk of reoffending. And if that benefits ex-offenders, it also benefits the rest of the community too. Many thanks. Now Colin Duncan McNeill, after which we'll move to closing speech from the Minister. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, to, to allow me to make a short contribution here. Um, Nanette Millen and others, uh, other colleagues from the, 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 the Health Committee uh, that uh, reported this week uh, have spoken. Um, and, uh, you know, we... we that, that report has become public this week, and in that investigation found um, that despite significant investment in tackling health inequalities in Scotland since devolution, uh, as has been mentioned many times here tonight, the gap between rich and poor re remains persistently wide, wide. That doesn't mean you say there was any willful um, neglect here, but uh, the best of intentions, uh, I think, uh, need to be recognised, didn't get the outcomes uh, that, that, we're, that we were looking for. And um, while the, the, the committee recognised clearly that uh, the NHS has a clear role to play in tackling health inequalities, it cannot do that on its own. We need to have a broader strategy uh, uh, within this parliament and within government to, to get the outcomes that we wanted. Some of those are within our gift, and uh, Bob Doris has mentioned some of that in terms of the benefit cuts that impact dramatically on the poor. Low pay, um, zero hour contacts, all of these things that disempower you know, large groups of uh, our constituents need to be tackled uh, as one. But that, that, that debate, um, you know, will come, and I don't intend to dwell too much more on that. We produced a report today, and we look forward to, uh, you know, a, a serious debate in this Parliament where that, our committee will challenge other committees to recognise their role 
and reducing inequalities in education, on, on, on committees that are looking at business and enterprise, and where, where is their strategy to produce uh, a more equal society in Scotland? And if we've got a chance to, to engender that debate and get some thinking in, uh, across government on, and across uh, uh, committees in, in, in the Parliament, then we might might, uh, we might get somewhere. I'm going to follow, and I took the opportunity here tonight to take uh, an opportunity to put on record my thanks to the, the project that has been mentioned here in, Inver in, in Inverclyde. And Mark Macdonald said that we have a responsibility in all of this to identify uh, good projects and where people are doing good and, and changing people's lives. So I, I intend to you know, try and just put on record my appreciation for the work of Mark, Mark and, uh, Martin Murray to identify that, that good work, but to also identify good people. Um, you know, I think while we, we, we look at, and it's been mentioned with ex-prisoners, and when we look at child poverty, when we look at fuel poverty, these are easy uh, uh, you know, issues for us uh, and derive a great sympathy within the general population. As Martin, Martin Murray says, caring for the homeless people is not one of the so-called popular services, but it's needed. These are our most excluded, our most disempowered um, uh, citizens in Scotland. Um, helping people to help themselves will benefit the whole society in the long run. And I truly believe that. And he's practising it in, in a poor community. Uh, at the Inverclyde Centre, he tries to see all of those who present themselves and offers them as much help as he can uh, with any health issue they may have. And we've got to remember that these people do not have the normal access to the GP. Some of them are barred from their GP because of the, the nature of, of, of their problems. So, you know, so we're, we, we, he's working there, and that project is working with a very difficult, excluded group. I wish them well. I wish uh, the, the nursing on the edge all the success that it deserves. And I believe that they're doing a wonderful job, not just in Inverclyde, but across Scotland. But we do need to see um, in all of these projects the type of commitment we see in other aspects of funding of the National Health Service. There shouldn't be a debate. There isn't any debate about the funding of, of the health service in general. We all agree it needs more and we want to give it more. But when we get to delivering on a very local level for the most difficult and hard to reach people, why, we've got to ask, is there a debate about long-term funding for these projects, knowing all the good that they can do. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr McNeill. And we now move the closing speech from the Minister, uh, Jimmy Hepburn. Seven Thank minutes you. all there by Minister, Thank please. you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And can I join with others uh, in uh, congratulating uh, Malcolm Chisholm for securing uh, this member's business debate tonight? And can I also uh, recognise his commitment uh, to uh, this uh, area, which I think is uh, shared by members uh, across the chamber. Can I also thank members for uh, taking part and apologise. I'm unlikely to be able to respond to every uh, single uh, point that's been made. But in closing uh, this uh, debate, I want to uh, emphasise this uh, government's commitment uh, to build a, a fairer Scotland, to continue to improve Scotland's health and to make every uh, effort to reduce uh, the health gap. Uh, overall, uh, health in Scotland is uh, improving. President officer, people are living uh, longer, healthier lives, which we should recognise and uh, celebrate. But I am also uh, acutely aware uh, that despite the efforts of this uh, and indeed previous administrations to tackle uh, health inequalities, it remains uh, a blight on our society. And at its root, uh, this is an issue of income inequality. We need a shift in emphasis from dealing with the consequences to tackling the underlying cause, poverty. Uh, the focus must be uh, in providing fair wages, supporting families and improving our physical and social uh, environments and measures. Uh, one of the measures uh, that this government has, of course, taken has included paying uh, the living wage to all uh, employed by the government and uh, those in the NHS. We have, of course, uh, commissioned the Poverty Alliance to promote uh, the uh, living wage in the private sector. And uh, recently, uh, the, uh, the payment of the living wage has been assessed uh, as one of the most effective interventions to tackle uh, inequalities and health inequalities in uh, particular. And at a time when we uh, face the UK government's welfare cuts, as has been mentioned by some uh, members, the government is working with its partners to tackle uh, poverty and inequality and help 
uh, those who want to get to work to get into work, and we are. Uh, briefly, Mr Finlay. Neil Finlay. I'm glad the Minister said what he said about um, uh, wealth inequality. Um, I wonder if he could advise us which government policies are designed to take money from the most wealthy and put it into the pockets of the poorest? We well, of one? course, uh, Mr. we've just been through a referendum that could have transferred substantial powers to this Parliament to uh, achieve that, and, uh, and we sadly didn't get uh, the result that I wanted, Mr Finlay, so we are limited in our ability to do that. But I'm just about to turn to some of the action we are taking in the face of the UK uh, Government's uh, welfare cuts, which puts money into the pockets of those facing the brunt of those cuts, because in this year, 2015-16, we are taking uh, real action. I can tell you, Mr Finlay, we are providing £104 million pounds to mitigate the welfare reforms being imposed uh, by Westminster via uh, the Welsh Scottish Welfare Fund, the Bedroom Tax uh, Support Council Tax Reduction Scheme and uh, Advice Services. Uh, the complexity of uh, resolving Scotland's health inequalities is uh, well understood, and it was highlighted in uh, the report uh, published uh, this week by the Health and Sport uh, Committee, which has, of course, been uh, mentioned. And as uh, Duncan McNeill, uh, the committee convener, uh, pointed, pointed out, this will uh, be debated in due course, and I look forward uh, to uh, seeing that. It is also uh, well understood that this is not uh, a problem for just the NHS, that all parts of uh, government and the wider uh, public sector have uh, a role uh, to play. Uh, despite the uh, challenges, uh, as the programme for government sets out, we remain determined to address uh, the social inequalities that lead uh, to health inequalities across uh, the whole country. Uh, can I turn to some of the uh, comments uh, that have been made, both uh, Neil Finlay and Elaine Murray, uh, and particularly she spent a great deal of uh, her contribution, quite rightly talking about uh, the prison uh, environment. Of course, I can say in Scotland we have a, a national prisoner a health care network that ensures that the inequalities agenda is reflected in each of its work streams, and particularly in uh, the uh, area of uh, substance um, use, misuse, but also mental health uh, and through care, care uh, areas. I want to uh, also uh, talk about uh, the importance of addressing uh, health inequalities through the integration of uh, adult health and social care, something uh, highlighted in Malcolm Chisholm's motion before us and something that he uh, spent uh, a great deal uh, talking about. Again, the programme for uh, government emphasises the vital uh, role that health and social care integration will play in delivering our uh, wider vision. Uh, the government is committed to improving public service and delivering uh, the support that Scotland's people value in line with the best evidence whilst ensuring our public services are uh, financially sustainable and indeed health inequalities feature as a specific outcome uh, for integration that is uh, set out in uh, regulations. Localities uh, provide a key opportunity uh, to ensure integrated uh, strategic uh, planning addresses inequalities and focuses on local priorities and annual performance reporting by the new integrated partnerships will demonstrate the contribution uh, they have made locally to reduce health inequalities using nationally comparable uh, data and locally available information. Uh, Malcolm Chisholm uh, wanted, uh, com uh, commented uh, on the uh, issue of uh, funding. He said that we must provide integration uh, boards uh, with resources to enable them to tackle inequalities. Well, of course, the statutory uh, minimum minimum of uh, services that must be delegated and the regulations will result in a minimum, a minimum of £7.6 billion uh, pounds being allocate, allocated to integration authorities in total across Scotland. And in uh, this uh, coming uh, financial year, we will increase the previously announced integration fund from £120 million pounds to £173.5 million, pounds, recognising uh, the need for new investment in uh, primary care. Patricia Ferguson talked about the role of uh, GPs, uh, particularly uh, those of the, in the deep end practice, I know they have worked very well. Having been on uh, the Welfare Reform Committee, they have, uh, were very informative in terms of uh, that work. I can also say that the Scottish Government is supporting the pilot of link workers at some of these practices to better uh, support uh, patients with mental uh, health issues. But uh, moving on from uh, the role of GPs and what we are debating uh, tonight, I want to talk about the vital role uh, that nurses play. And I join with others in welcoming the Royal College of Nursing's initiative, Nursing on uh, the Edge, uh, which is a very positive and well-received campaign highlighting uh, the key role uh, the nurses play in reducing health inequalities. I will be happy to meet with them to discuss their campaign and wider uh, work uh, sometime. Uh, as the RCN campaign has highlighted, nurses have a critical role as catalysts for empowering the communities and work uh, with them to enable uh, them to be involved in decisions that affect uh, their own uh, health. Nurses have a critical role in meeting our aim of tackling uh, in, uh, equalities. Um, 
I probably should uh, turn uh, to close. I see I'm running uh, out of uh, time, uh, President Officer. Let me say we will always uh, be uh, open uh, to refining our systems based on uh, the evidence before us uh, that this can lead to reducing uh, inequality. Uh, Duncan McNeill spoke about a project in his area. Mark McDonald highlighted the example of the Middlefield uh, Community Project in his uh, constituencies, and certainly he invited me to attend. If uh, we can find time for that, I'd be very happy to consider uh, a visit. But in conclusion, I, I very much welcome uh, that we've had this uh, debate today, and uh, I recognise the excellent work done by nurses across Scotland and highlighted by the uh, Nursing on the Edge campaign. The Scottish Government will continue to ensure uh, that making the integration of health and social care uh, uh, a reality uh, that will transform how health and social care is delivered in Scotland, and that nursing is at the forefront of tackling health inequalities, something I can assure members is also a priority and an absolute commitment for me in my ministerial role, President Officer. Many thanks. Well, thank you all for your part in this debate. And I now close this meeting of Parliament.